Hey, hey, hey. Hey, guys. Oh, oh my gosh. You know I was the, dancing. By the way, Adam, did you see uh, – maybe you didn't. I think – I don't remember where he messaged me, but do you remember Wookie? Apparently, he has a yeah. band. And he wants to he wants to try out some songs for us for the opening uh, song. How cool would that be? Nice. Oh wait, that would be cool. I don't think it's a band. I think he does. So by the way, his name's Chris. We used to work with uh, him. And the reason why he was his name was his nickname was Wookie was because I think he was like six ten, like super tall. Anytime this guy like, walked in a room, yeah, he's like six like seventeen. I mean, it's it's <laughs> insane. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he does. I remember he does. Um, he does I'm like, like a, you know, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> what does I that mean, equal? I don't even know. When, when he know, I, I when he says raise the roof, he's actually just you know issuing a command. <laughs> it's, yeah, it starts with ouch, like ouch. I raise the roof. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, listen. I think I think it'd be really cool to get some some more house music, you know, from the community and. You know, mix yeah, it as up long as, as long as when I'm on, you play that song because I love that song. Yeah, I do too, and I told him that, so he's got a high bar to meet, I think. Um, but that would be really cool just to see, uh, see, you know, because I mean, we know him, so how cool would it be to have like something personalized? That would be pretty awesome. That'd be great. Yeah, be I'm, great. I'm so in for that, and it's okay because that that here we go song just runs through my head day and night. Like I, I, I know. We need some it's variety. Like, it's like point. good walkout music. Have, have you guys ever gone to a conference and done a talk where they ask you for the walkout music? I was just like, the first time that happened, I was like, what? And I was like, immigrant song. Totally. It was great. Everybody else had like the most aggressive track was like a Dave Matthews band song. I was like, I <laughs> feel like an idiot. Mine was but friends in low places it. and they got, that got rejected. So I had to like pick something different, but I was like, Come on, friends in low places. No. I, I like that though. It reminds me of uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of sticking with the office theme based on your background. Reminds me of like when Dwight went into before he went into a sales meeting, he listened to like heavy, metal. you know, heavy yeah. rock, heavy metal, and he's punching the seat. That's yeah. me before any type of talk. Although I'll, I'll say with containers from the couch, I I don't do that as much. You're pretty chill. You're pretty chill. But generally before, yeah, you gotta have some good pump up music, you know. 100%. Well, what are we getting pumped up for today? I don't know. You guys have a lot of infrastructure stuff going on. Mm. We're, we're, we're running. I'm pretty psyched. But I'm here to break customized managed node groups in EKS. <laughs> it's a special skill you have. <laughs> yeah. I, anybody who uh, who's re, you know rejoining from last Thursday witnessed uh, an apocalyptic uh, dumpster fire of Jesse trying to show you things. So I just want to say, I, I yeah, I'm an I'm an engineer. I tinker with stuff, and so at any given time, yes, on my laptop, I'm not a I'm not a good cloud denizen. I don't use uh, I don't use cloud development environments. Just on my laptop, I've got like development builds. I've got development libraries. I have dev clusters. Like it's just crazy. And my laptop crashed too. So I rebooted this thing just a little while ago. We should be good. We should be good. Um, <laughs> And and uh, and I did prep all the demos independently, so we can at least like dump out some text to show how they should work. Nice. Uh, it's almost like your demos are like it's like ahead. a cellular architecture. So if one demo breaks, you still have many more to show. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So That's awesome. I like you, it. Did you put like one cloud nine per demo so that it's just a completely independent? No, nah, still, still did now, nah, still didn't. Use no, he has like nine. he has nine laptops. Each still, laptop no, just, is responsible for one demo, and they're all immutable, which means when he's angry, like, he yeah. throws the laptop. Absolutely, that's, works. that's that's my resilience model. My fault tolerance is I have three laptops, and I'm just going to throw them out the window as they fail. Yes, um, that's awesome. You guys have to remember, I'm like a borderline gray beard, like I'm like an old guy, so I just have like a terminal Same borderline. By the way, <laughs> I'm a well, yeah, okay, I'm a gray beard. <laughs> And I have just like a terminal and VI. That's like that's my IDE, right? So, so just bear with me here. I, I'm really trying Perfect. to be uh, be modern for your internet television program. Yeah, I mean, you, you've beard. seen some things, so like yeah. you know, that's yeah. totally but fine. I do want to ask uh, a true gravy. Do you use VI or do you use VI improved? Are you using VI or Vim? 
No, you I can't use, BI. use everything is Vim. No, I mean no, seriously. I no, just yeah. I just want to rewind. Nobody uses Vi. Right. Some people I, use VI. I'm just asking. Oh, thank you. Thank I, you. Yeah. Okay. I but. used to work I used to work indirectly for Bill Joy, right? So I can say that. Um no, I I'm a VI user for so I've been using Vim for years and now I use uh, sometimes I'll use that VS Code with, and I use it in VI mode. At um, VS Code. <laughs> VS, that VS Code thing. I d real. Right. I like this from that whole real graybeards. You said, I like. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show Ed. you that I'm there, using there said. Is. I'm using said in one of these scripts. I'll show you right where I'm using it. Oh, Justin says Ed is true editor, right? Yeah. I know people. I just that said use Ed. That. That's that's yep. hilarious. I used to work with a guy that had a 30 inch CRT and he just lived in Emacs and his breakout one line editor was Ed. It was hilarious. Totally. I say Vi <laughs> and I say GIF, all right? And I'm yeah. owning it. And hey, I man, say we love Coob, Coob Cuddle we, Controls. We love you just the way you are. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. So yeah, I, I'm so happy to be here again. I thank you very much. I think even the message, the, the kerfuffle of all my stuff exploding last week, I didn't even really get to speak to the feature and what it can do for you. And you know, the context here is like EKS is awesome for you know removing that that term that we use, undifferentiated heavy lifting. What that really means is like the operational toil of building and running clusters and keeping them running, you get to give that to us. And with managed node groups, you get to do that with your nodes. And we already have Fargate. We already have managed node groups. You have EKS Cuddle. We have Cloud Formation. You have Terraform. We have so many ways to do these things. GitOps is a movement. It's got its own tool chain. Like, there's there are so many options here. The real win here with customized managed node groups is that for people who have been using self-managed nodes, because they have to control declarative configuration for their nodes. They have to use their own custom AMIs. They have to you know, inject their own configuration. They can now use managed nodes, which now allows you to shift that operational toil of, of the lifecycle management of your nodes. And some people are running clusters of four, six, you know, 5,300 nodes. I mean, anything over 20 nodes really is like, geez, you've got to automate it anyhow. And it's not that people haven't done that, they have, but this is a way for you to not have to reinvent the wheel or to, to move away from having to maintain your own complex systems of managing your node life cycles. And, so that's really the context. You know, I like an example is, you know, if you're managing this on your own and you have to upgrade to version that you're running, you have to think about rolling out new, new servers, terminating the old ones. You know, there's a lot of consideration there. Uh, when you're doing Absolutely. this on your own, yeah. I mean, if you're you if you're, you're making me cry, you're you're uh, speaking my language so much. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you have say a requirement that you need, uh, you know, around compliance, you have to, for example, you have to stig harden an image. You, you, that's just a. I mean, you can't do that without launch templates with managed node groups. So you've been using self managed nodes. And on top of that, you have an OS. Maybe your, you know, maybe your org is aligned on on a Red Hat or Debian, or or maybe you build your own custom uh, images, right? With, with who who knows? Maybe it's an edge case, and you're using BuildRoot to to create your node images. I mean, it could be anything. And now, as long as that AMI can boot an instance, which can run the ECAS Bootstrap or what you put in its place, you can use it with a managed node group, which is which is really cool. And you know, with using launch templates in EC2, which is a, you know, a very mature feature of, you know, how you can define an ASG. And that and that's really what a managed node group is, is under the covers, it's an EC2 autoscaling group. So being able to put declarative configuration into like a JSON blob and keeping that inversion control, and then using the launch template capability of creating versions where you can indicate an origin ver a, a source version and then create a new version and then using eks managed node groups to upgrade uh your your nodes to that new version and and eks will manage you know draining your nodes keeping all of your services available and sort of iterating through until the configuration lands at the right place that's a pretty powerful thing where you know even if you're saying well we're okay with self-managed nodes. Kick the tires on this because you might find it's like you don't have to manage that all that other stuff that you're doing, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. When I think about that whole management aspect of it, imagine, you know, there's a, a line down the middle of, I don't know, your field of view or whatever. And on the left side is, is AWS on the right side is everything you own. So when you shift something to be managed by AWS, you're shifting it over that line and AWS will take responsibility for it. Think about it in terms of that is just an expansion of your team. You know, if you think about it, like everything that is over that line that that you're handing over to AWS to manage, that has a team of developers and, and operations people that back it. You know, like so auto scale groups and launch templates and all that. There's a team of people that built that and they maintain it and they constantly upgrade it. They make it work, they make it uh, functional and, and enhance it and so on and so forth. And you don't have to do anything and you just get to benefit from it. So why wouldn't you do that? You know, like in all exactly. seriousness, that helps you work on the things that only your team can work on, right? There's there's not a team at AWS that can that can build your company and and work on the things that your company does that differentiate it from every other company out there. So focus on that stuff as much as possible and let the boilerplate, let the regular old uh, everyday stuff that, that we can manage, let us manage it for you. You get support for all that stuff. It a lot of times doesn't cost any extra, you know, like it doesn't cost any extra to have an auto scale group, I think. I should probably check that before I say it. No, it doesn't. Yeah, no, it doesn't. That's yeah. Awesome. No. Ma yeah. Using managed node groups, there's no cost whatsoever. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, you know, the cost is the node compute. Yeah. And, exactly. and that's the really cool thing here is that this is an automated system that's going to offload all of that burden for you. But its job is to automate the provisioning and lifecycle management of your EC2 instances in your account. Right. So, yeah, if, if you yeah. don't need to manage your nodes, if you don't need access to your nodes, if you don't need to ever look at them, um, if you don't need to customize them, you should be looking at Fargate and seeing if yeah. that addresses your needs. But you know, right down that middle, like you said, where you, you sort of you need you need operational control over what those nodes are doing, and you need access to them. But you'd like to benefit from the automation. You'd like to expand your team, right, yeah, and and, exactly. and leverage AWS for that. Um, that's where managed nodes uh, node groups is. It hits that sweet spot. It really so, is having your cake and eating it too. So I said that last time, but I really like you really you get go. you get the benefits of managed you know AWS managing the nodes for you to with upgrades and all the, all this great functionality, but you still have configuration ability to make changes to the nodes and make them tweak them to fit your needs. Right. And right. by the way, um, we, coming soon is going to be the containers from the couch store where we're going to have framed pictures of Brent with all of his quotes. And uh, pricing is not available yet, but um, st stay we, tuned. We'll pay you to buy them. <laughs> <laughs> I just love your I love I love your quotes, Brent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, by the way, Anton Christensen uh, says, "I woke up today dreaming about having the chance to see my heroes live. I guess dreams do come true. Happy Thursday, Brent and Adam and gang. Uh, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for joining us. And by the way." Uh, if you've been watching us on the AWS channel at Twitch, uh, we do have now a new channel that we opened up as of today. Uh, so you can still find us on slash AWS, but you can also find us at AWS containers. Uh, so if you're interested in this content and you want the push notification uh, for the show going live for this show specifically, you can get it by subscribing to that page. And we're going to go live uh, on both Twitch accounts simultaneously for the foreseeable future. We also, of course, go live on YouTube. So if it's easier for you to watch on YouTube or you like YouTube's interface better, uh, absolutely uh, subscribe there as well. And you can get push notifications for when we go live uh, on YouTube also. Yes. All right. Awesome. Should so we, we get can, started? Well, yeah, let me jump into some of these uh, showing off type demos. Um, and then, you know, what I decided to do is actually do this live. I, I confused myself last time considerably trying to pre-bake things in different clusters. And uh, no, no, 
I mean, it's going to break on its own anyway. So it's, and that, that is no fault of EKS. Of course, that would be my fault. Um, <laughs> this thing's rock solid, but uh, I did want to just kind of give a little preamble and say, I'm going to build these as we go. And I have faith that we can get through them all. Um, but we're going to be able to talk while I'm, uh, you know, while things are are kind of cooking. So, so let's first look at just an example that, that we did look at, um, you know, last week. Um, we have a really, this is a launch template, right? And I think this is not going to be new to anybody. Can you guys see that? Okay. The, I think yep. could, I'm guessing they're going to, they're going to ask for it to be a little bigger. Yeah. A little Remember, bigger. It has to be uncomfortable for your vision. And that means it's good for the, 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 the audience. The viewers. Yes. Okay. How's, yes. how's that? Maybe a little, oh my God. All right, cool. <laughs> see already. I'm already off to the races here. Um, Okay, so I just wanted to show this. So this is a launch awesome. template. Um, you know, we, we're we putting in JSON. Now you can do this through the console, you can do this through the API, you can do this a lot of different ways. Um, this is, you know, how I prefer to do things, which is with JSON blobs, and you can keep them in, uh, you know, source control, it's really great. So you can see we're good. this is just a basic example. So we're, we're defining our instance type. Um, we're defining a, a key name for SSH access. Uh, the security groups, these these are aligned with the, the security groups that I have in my VPC for both the, um, <laughs> at several PS ones, by the way. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so for the security groups are the cluster security group and then a remote access, like an SSH security group, and then some tags. And this is this is something that people have been wanting for a long time. So So these tags will land on the EC2 instances as they're provisioned. Right, so this is a, a great way to say, okay, well, there's going to be, you know, um, so EKS will will land some private tags in there, I think, and some and some labels. These are tags that you can control, so you can see it's a stage as a dev, the owner is me. You can put a billing code in there, you know, whatever. So this How is how those tags propagate, by the way. Like, where do do they propagate? Maybe is probably what I should ask. So, so propagation in, so there, that there's tech, you know, there is, there is a specific thing with tag propagation, right? Which they're working on for MNG. Um, but right now these tags will, you know, if, you know, as far as the verb goes, they will propagate to the instances. Yes. Um, you know, at AWS, we also have a way for tags to propagate through related resources. And that's, that's okay. being worked on as, as far as I know. Cool. Um, so what we'll do is we just take that um, take, take that JSON blob, the tilde at the end of it for some reason. I don't know. Oh, God. You know, this is what happens when I try to talk and type. Yeah, I was going to say, while you're doing that, my, my little daughter just walked in and she gave me a little Lunchable uh, <laughs> snack for uh -huh. lunch. That was really nice. Well, it's kind it's of funny strange. because Quince Leaf wanted a picture of Adam eating cake, framed, of course. Yes. And uh, then I suggested maybe what about uh, how about a GIF with Adam eating GIF? I so, think it's perfect, and we can, you know, because to me, I pronounce it graphical user interface. <laughs> so, do you say giraffe too? I do, actually, I do. Okay. <laughs> All right, I get it. I don't think uh, I, I. I just I'll give in. I'm gonna eat my lunch. All right, so let me see here. What did I Tonight. do? Why is this not tab completing? I don't. I don't understand. <laughs> this is it. awesome. All right, so every Thursday from now on, Jesse will be on the show. Yes. <laughs> maybe I. Maybe I closed. I mean, I have these little helpers. I don't know. Yeah, did you check GitHub? Maybe that's it's somewhere in, in, in <laughs> GitHub. Thank you, Justin. I feel like Justin's on my side. Just don't respond, even if you're not. I'm just gonna take the win. Justin Jarrison, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, there we go. I give up. I like it. Pavan, thank you for what the save. Even? <laughs> Pavan, we're not friends. All right, anymore. so and then yeah, custom MNG. Okay, cool, 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 cool. I, I figured, I figured out my thing. 
And this is just like a little shell script thing that I wrote to help like organize myself. <laughs> oh, good. Did I do it? Do I, did I get the wrong name yet again? Custom MNG? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a this is a gray beard thing, right? I turn every dash into an underscore, an underbar, because I wrote just C code for like ever. Um, this is probably at this point it's active. Yeah, okay. So this whole thing here was we were gonna watch it be uh, creating. It's already active. So um, yeah. uh, yeah, it's funny. So um, that's the first node group in this cluster. So we'll see. We got some. We got some. Uh, we got some nodes made. And I'm just going to bounce over to the console to show you, although I, I know you trust me, um, that they're running. So I've got some terminated ones. I just had filters set up there. I don't know where they yeah, went. Yeah, you, you have to hit that little refresh button in the console. If you refresh the whole thing, all your filters go. Oh, yeah. it's ridiculous. Anyway, look, Feature ignore request. the terminated ones. But you can see here, you know, we've got some T, T3 smalls. And, you know, if we go down here to the tags, we'll see the tags landed. There's my... Butler Jail owner, you know, stage is dev. This is great. So this gives you just right out of the box a lot of cool features. That, you know, just to get started with, you have declarative configuration for managed nodes. That's that's cool. And this was that um, first JSON blob you showed us. Is that the first one you deployed? It is exactly. Yep. Yep. Cool. And so the the other thing here on the base and sort of on the basic side of stuff, I want to show you is that workflow that we talked about where. You can now update your launch template version, keeping the same launch template, keep the same node group. You can update that node group, and EKS will will do the right thing and go through and drain your nodes. So what we're going to do here uh, is we're going to say we've got the instance type that we want. The tags are great. Security groups are right. The the nodes came up, join the they join the cluster. We're happy. We'd like to install the Amazon SSM agent and configure it and run it on our nodes, on our managed nodes, and maybe something else too. So I, I added in just an example of being able to, uh, to do a multiple things. So what you'll see here is that this is a script that's in mind format. And mind format is just a way to pack a bunch of other things into one file. And so this is the delimiter right here. And uh, now you can have multiple scripts. So this is technically two scripts. They're both shell scripts. You can see one will install SSM agent, enable it, and start it. And the other will do a little bit of a fancy uh, message of the day for us. We'll, we'll put NeoFetch in, and, and uh, it'll show us that. And that, that's just an example of, like, literally, you could do anything. Um, as yeah. long as you don't break Kubelet from starting and don't you know um, end up with the, boot, with the uh, EKS boot strap script not working, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, and the node will come up. It has a runtime. It's got kubelet, and it'll join the cluster. You can do literally anything you need to. Um, so this is just an example. Awesome. So what fantastic. we do here is uh, we put that into our JSON blob as user data. So you can see this is all that's in this launch template data. And this is just base64 encoded. Or as some people think, encrypted, but it's not. It's, it's not <laughs> encrypted. Uh, it's just encoded, and it just makes it easier for us to push it around um, and not worry about white space and stuff like that in our scripts. So um, yeah, that's all this oh, is. Like this is base64 encoded that script and set as user data. The thing to note here is we're going to use this to update and create a new launch template version. Anything we don't specify will stay in place. Right, so everything that we have existing in this launch template will stay there, and then this new user data will get landed on top of it. Because I can't talk and talk and type at the same time, I can't even talk really. Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> um, so you see, I'm going to say our source version is one, so the one we just created, that blob we saw before, and I'm going to add a version description, which I advise you to do, so that when you're looking through your versions, you can see what changes. It's sort of just like Git commits. Like what's different? What what changed? So we're adding adding a little something something, and what that'll do is it'll spit out the whole thing. So just like I said, you see our instance type is still set, um, our SSH H key is still there. Now we see our new user data script, and then our tags are still here, security group IDs, all that other stuff. Um, and so what we can do now, let me clean this mess up, and and make another one. So what we can do now. Uh, as we've already got this created, we can uh, invoke the update. And so let me just do that quick. 
So using the AWS CLI. Yes, and this, this is all the CLI so far. Um, we can do this in the console. The console folks have done a great job making a nice workflow there. It's really easy. When you create a manage node group, you just sort of, you can just specify um, the launch template. Um, I can actually just show you that real quick if you're interested. That would be cool. Um, so yeah. let's jump into this cluster. I'm not going to kick it just because I it'll screw me all up. But um, so right, you go into compute. This is where you see your managed nodes, um, your managed node groups rather. So uh, you can add a node group, and right here you see launch template. This is a new feature. So this looks exactly like it's always looked. But right here, if you click this. You can now select a launch template and it'll come out of your account, like whatever you have there. So you can go actually bounce out, go and create a new one, hit refresh, it'll show up. So really slick. And that you know works exactly the same way. Uh, yeah, but you know, if you're a console user. UI too. UX. Mm -hmm. So if and, you're yeah, uh, if you're a console user, that's that's there for you. And I just wanted to ask, so I saw it was in a status of updating. Could you maybe uh just like walk us through, you know, like maybe you know, behind the scenes, you know, what, what's happening yeah. behind the scenes there? Well, you can even see it in your instance list. What you'll see is, uh, so right now you see there's two nodes coming up, our two are already there, right? And so what's not gonna happen is all your nodes gonna go away while it's building new, new nodes. The promise of this update is that EKS will drain your nodes and will keep your services available which is going to make sure that your minimum uh, node count in your, in your node group is going to be maintained. So minus two. So now we can see there are four instances. And what will happen is the instances will boot up. EKS will check in with its bootstrap. It'll phone home. It'll be like, yep, I'm joining the cluster. We're all good. For a period of time, you will have more than your original nodes and your target number of nodes as things settle out. But what we would find is if we if we logged into these instances, if we took a look, the two that you see are initializing will now have SSM uh, agent installed and configured, and we'll have a fancy little MOTD. Um, and the ones that don't have that will eventually be cycled out of the node group. And so when when this lands at a disposition of active, because right now I believe it's still yeah it's still updating. This takes a little time because it does that. It does it very carefully, yeah. and. Um, yeah, but this what, is, what will it, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I just, so, I mean, oh, so this is really, this is handling the rescheduling of the pods, right, to the new nodes yeah, once they come up, they're healthy. Yeah. Right, like, that's, oh yeah, sorry, I might have port, abstracted that. When I say, and drain. yeah, when I say it drains your nodes, there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> yes, it, it'll drain the work from your nodes, which are going to be offline as new nodes become available to reschedule the work too. Fantastic. If that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. So I noticed the third and four. Oh, no, one's shutting down. Wait, what's happening? Yeah, here? and you'll he, see. Yeah. So sometimes it'll, four. yep. Sometimes it'll do spot tests. Sometimes you'll actually see you have more than twice as many as you'd expect. And that's, that's what you, this will all just sort of do, do the right thing and land you at the right place. And, you know, with such a small cluster, this takes a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've seen it take, it's really weird. So, you know, it usually takes about five minutes with two nodes. Mm -hmm. I've seen it take seven, eight. I have seen it take like one and a half or two. And I'm like, how did that work? Like it just, boom, I'm done. But you know, there's there's an interesting uh, combination of things that I think a lot of people might find in, if they were doing this in production. Um, you know, in production, you might also be running the cluster autoscaler. And the cluster autoscaler, is sitting there adjusting those minimum and maximum numbers for the auto scale group. And you've just come along and adjusted the launch template that is tied to that auto scale group. So those two things are actually perfectly fine working together. And you don't yeah. like this time around with low traffic, you have two nodes, but next time around, if this was a production cluster, you might have 20 nodes. And the, mm -hmm. the actions that you go through are exactly the same. And it just it just works its way through the whole cluster, whatever size it happens right. to be. And it will continue to maintain that size. I, I just kind of put that together in my head. Yeah. But that's really awesome how like all these things can work together and solve, you know, all of those problems for you. 
Yeah, that's that's how we build features and you know, not only in EKS but in everything, right? The everything in AWS sort of works backwards from your experience as a customer. Um, so what you know, part of that is saying, well, how is this going to interact with things I'm already using? How what what can we take advantage of that already exists? How do we not reinvent the wheel and make this a simpler, less complex solution? So yeah, all of this stuff is designed to work together. Um, with, you know, without surprise, that's another tenant. I think we're just, when you roll something new out, you don't want surprises. Um, so I think, yeah. yeah, we can let that run. I mean, it's going to take a little while. Like I said, sometimes the, the other thing about this is it maps exactly to that workflow that you were talking about, Adam, where if you're maintaining your own AMIs, um, which we'll see in a second, you, you all, you specify custom AMIs through the launch templates as well. So this workflow that we're seeing right now is exactly how you know, there's a new CVE out, you're responsible for, you know, kind of building a new version of your AMI. Um, you push that through your pipeline, you update your launch template to point to the new AMI, and you just say, okay, EKS, make make it happen, right? Do do what you need to do, rather than having to do that part yourself. So it, it lends itself to more automation. And again, people have automated these solutions. It just, this just means you don't have to maintain your own automation anymore. Yeah, that's the key. That's the key. And it's it's nice. Someone out there deleted, you know, some really great code they wrote. And now that's one less thing that they have to maintain. That's right. That's right. I think, um, you know, it, speaking speaking to my gray beard past as an OS engineer, we always had this. So you have bragging rights and people talk about lines of code, you know, from way back where you would be judged on the lines of code you write, which is just preposterous. Our bragging rights were as uh, around removing code. Can you remove yeah. code? Can you, can you push a change? So my friend Mike Gertz, I think, won this battle uh, over years, mind you. Uh, our, our good friend Peter Remission was, was sort of at the front runner where he had written whole drivers. He'd worked on entire subsystems. He worked on the streams module in the, in the, in the uh, Unix uh, operating system that we worked on, which is the Solaris. And uh, just you know, tens of the hundreds of thousands of lines of code. I wrote drivers, so every time I did a project, it was 40, 50,000 lines of code, and I was just hopelessly behind, you know? But uh, Mike actually did so much refactoring that the last push he did before he left for a new job actually brought him close to zero. And that was always a goal, is like, can you can you remove code? Uh -huh. So this is, this is a freebie for you, right? If you have, yeah. you know, 3,000 lines of bash and duct tape, right? You can remove that code. You don't have to worry about it. Exactly. I think it's always a win. Amen. All right. So I don't know that that could be done. It, we'll just let it keep running. I think you get the idea here and we can we can check back in with that. But we can move on to the next one because, of course, we can create multiple manage no groups and delete them and work with them independently. Um, so I do I want to make sure we don't run out of time. So I'm going to kick this one. Then we'll go back and check in on that one. Okay. So this is exactly the same workflow where we have a um, a script and this script actually, um, if you can see it, it's a little big because we made the font so big. I spent so much time trying to make sure I could fit it on one screen. I was not thinking. Um, so here we see our MIME format. Here's our shell script and we're gonna go through and we're actually going to decide we wanna use containerd as the runtime rather than Docker on our nice. on our EKS managed nodes. So this script, all this does is, you know, this is a real sysadmin type script. It will make sure the container D is in place, it'll configure it. We configure cry. Now, if anybody's um, not familiar with this, so Kubernetes has a runtime interface, which is cry or CRI. And that allows you to use multiple different types of runtimes, uh, where it's system D, container D, cryo. So container D itself actually has an in-memory cry plugin now. So all you have to do is have container D running and in place and it will, it will fulfill its role as a, a CRI runtime. So we just have to set up a little config for that. And then uh, we put the containerd config in place. And then we do a little bit of massaging with the systemd um, fragments that make up the containerd, I mean, uh, the kubelet service to actually set containerd as the runtime. Um, and you don't have to grok all this. If anybody's really interested in this, I can put it on a, a, a GitHub or something. I'll put it in a tweet. How's that? Um, and yeah. look, I'm using said, you guys. See? Said. Nice. So because the default, um, you know, this is all working with the EKS optimized Amazon Linux 2 AMI that 
EKS uses by default. This is not a custom AMI, right? This is all just configuration in that user data. So we actually have to modify the existing config as it is, which is using Docker as a runtime. So we're going uh, using said and, and uh, swapping some things out in place. And then um, we go through and actually make sure the config's in place, then we kill off kubelet because the EKS bootstrap wants to start that. So I'm just gonna say, we're gonna stop kubelet and we're gonna move on our merry way. And when EKS comes along to turn that into a managed node, it'll kick the bootstrap, which will start kubelet for us. Nice. So let's take a look at our config. Again, we just have a pretty basic. Now we're not gonna update, this is a brand new node group. So again, it's very basic. We just have our instance type, uh, security groups, and then blob. That's our user data script, which is base64 encoded. And some tags, and I added a runtime tag too, right? So now we can say, oh, well, what, what of our, our nodes are running containerd as a runtime? And this isn't a requirement of switching to the runtime. That's just notes for that's us, just, right? Yeah, tags, tags just a really yeah. great place to store, you know, things that relate to billing data, relate to department use or whatever, and you can use it for anything. So that's just a way to descriptively say, um, you know, these nodes are running containerd, not required at all. Yeah. So the same yeah, just, workflow as before. You know, seeing that containerd flag, and just thinking like if you were you wanted to test migrating to containerd, you know, like this is a great way you spin up an extra node group, you slowly start testing your pods in this new node group, and as they work, you just switch your labels, and that's how you've tested, uh, you know, this new functionality. It's just cool. I, I like this. Exactly. Nice demo. Super cool. Super cool. So did you get that yeah. one going? Yep, that's kicked off. Um, so we can. I wanted to address a couple of the, a couple of the questions and comments in chat. So first, your mention of Bash and duct tape is a hit because uh, <laughs> he wants to now get a uh, quince leaf wants to get a, a biker style tattoo of that, and uh, Nethole thinks that would be a good band name. So uh, totally, uh, Amandeep. Be Oh, I'm sorry. I totally started down that road and couldn't finish it. Um, my apologies. But uh, one one actual question: Do I have to worry about IP address contention during this update for large clusters if it's updating in parallel? And the answer is sort of, um, but maybe not. So there's a couple of strategies you can employ when it comes to IP address. Uh, contention for EKS. First, um, if you own the VPC, then obviously, and especially if you built it with EKS control, then I think that by default builds a slash 16. So you should be good when it comes to IP address contention. But there are cases, especially in large enterprises, where you might have like a direct connect to a data center um, where you are you are sharing an IP space and you have maybe it's a slash 19 or something much smaller uh, allocated to the VPC. In that circumstance, if you are allocating those, uh, you know, IP addresses that are owned by, you know, your data center or whatever shared with your data center, that in that case, yeah, you might, you might run into a problem. So, um, there is a strategy where you can have a second IP range for the VPC, and you can have all of your nodes come up with the primary IP range, but all the pods come up with the secondary IP range. And that's really what's going to keep you from exhausting those IPs, because those secondary ENIs on the instance, they'll come up and populate with all the IPs from that secondary IP range, which is a slash 16. So um, definitely check out that kind of strategy for managing IP space if, if you're worried about uh, IP contention. And we should do a show on that, by the way. Should we do that maybe next week? Yes. I think we should. Yeah, through. that'd be interesting. Yeah, let's do that. So thank you for the, uh, the inspiration. We'll, we'll cover that next week. So hey, um, I just wanted to bounce over and check out one of those nodes that we'd updated. So we have our... Our fancy MOTD, which was one really of our nice scripts. MOTD. <laughs> That's one of our scripts. And then the other one, here we see Amazon SSM agent is installed and it's running. And again, this is a managed node. So this isn't anything you couldn't have done with a self-managed node, but 
this is a managed node. We didn't provision this thing. And if we had to update it, we can just do it push button. Super cool. Um, and so that's just an example of really anything. This could be uh, any software that you want to install, configure. You can put kernel tunings in place. You could look at Sysdig and Falco and configure all of that and have it just in your managed nodes. It's it's super cool. Um, let's get out of that one and we'll see how our container D managed node group is doing. Yep, it's active. Sorry for the Python dumps. That's just me control seeing out of the, the CLI. So um, yeah, let's just, the quick way to do this, right, is we'll just describe, describe our nodes and we'll grab out the runtime. But I can't even, I can't even type one sentence while I'm talking, geez. All right. <laughs> so remember, I got a bunch of things here, but a bunch of nodes, but there's our two container D ones, there right? Nice. Could be a thousand, could be two thousand, whatever. We just got two, but pretty cool. I love that. Um, you awesome. know, speaking of you know, shell scripts and duct tape. I mean, that's that's sort of how I do most of my work, right? So anytime I can take my shell scripts and put them in source control and put them into some sort of declarative configuration for things I actually depend on, is just a winner. You know, so this was me hacking on this for about an hour or something. I figured out how to get this going. Now it's you know now it's sort of in a place where it's considered the single source of truth for my configuration for that node group. That's pretty powerful. That's awesome. I like it. Yeah. Shell like scripts it. and duct tape. Yeah. Oh, I we're did, making shirts. <laughs> we're making shirts. I'm doing stickers. This is a whole thing. I should trademark yeah. that, I guess. Yeah. yeah. You better hurry. You should. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So what were we doing? Okay. So we got the container D. We got the other thing going. We're cool. Now let's go for the big guns and say, you know what? We want to configure things, but we can't configure the distro we're running. We want to configure things, but we can't strip down everything on the root file system like we want in a configuration script, right? So this is where custom AMIs come into play. Uh, and I got a few demos to look at here. We can kick them all off and, and just take a look. I know, um, I think we had one of the regular viewers last week who was really interested in this and security. So I, I have three things just I'll tell you right now in case my laptop just catches on fire and I disappear because this is going so great. Um, one, we're going to use EKS Cuddle. We're going to bring uh, EKS Cuddle to the party and we're going to create a managed node group which actually uses RHEL 7. Then we're going to go back to the CLI. We're going to create a managed node group with a custom AMI that is RHEL 7 and STIG hardened. And then we're going to go for the for the piece to resistance, I don't know, whatever the heck the best thing is, or the icing on the cherry cake. I don't know how this stuff goes. Bottle rocket. Do, do you eat food? Like That seemed facetious, I, but I literally just did trip on my own words. I have no idea. Icing the cherry is on the, of the cherry cake. Chrome he's ring, literally, I don't know. He's literally creme de la a creme. And, creme de la creme. Quincy says like, creme de la creme. Uh, creme but I'm I got going with it. Jesse, weren't you a chef in your time? Like, and now I'm imagining you I was making a you put cherries on top, and then you put. I was a saucier. I never got into that. I, yeah, no, no pastry right. chefing for me. I'm sorry, that stuff is too advanced. Okay, I was All a right. saucier. Yeah, I was Clearly. the guy in the back. I was the guy in the back of the room in ratatouille, just stirring the pot. That was me. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I love ratatouille. That's such a good movie. Great movie. All right. Wow. So, Tensleaf oh. was a pastry chef. Nice. Oh my gosh. Holy smokes! All right, so I was front, I was out front and on the line, and you were in the pastry. So we probably had cocktails together. That's that's really the only way I ever interacted with the pastry chefs is they made really nice boat drinks at the end of their shifts right before I was well boat right drinks? before I went to work and boat drinks. You know what boat drinks are? Drinks that you drink on a boat. Well, yes, but those are always nice and fancy, right? So boat uh, drinks. That's always no, no. A, that's a good thing. Boat drinks. I think it's from uh, 10 Things to Got Do in it. Denver When You're Dead, that Andy Garcia movie. Okay. Remember that one? That was their goal, boat drinks. Yeah. It's really good. Anyway, I'm really, really that doing great today. Continues like, to make fun of you. He he laughs and says he had air conditioning. Yeah, correct. I had uh, a lot of hot air in my face. <laughs> okay, so let's kick one of these off while we keep talking about how Gen X I am. Um Okay, so same way, uh, we're going to specify some user data and we're going to specify uh, other things in the launch template. 
when you're using a custom AMI, we're basically handing you the keys to the car, which means you have to do some things for us to make it a managed node. Primarily, we have to make sure that Kubernetes is in place and Kube, you know, um, Kubelet's in place and that the configuration's running and everything that can actually do the, you know, serve the purpose of a Kubernetes node. And then there's also a, an EKS uh, bootstrap script that you have to put in place, which is what is used to sort of uh, join it to the cluster in EKS. So we can look at uh, a very simple example of this with this rel bootstrap. That's it. So basically, you make sure that you build your AMI uh, with EKS you know, support in it, and you just invoke the bootstrap script with the cluster name. Now, if it's going to be spawning managed nodes on a private network, you will also need to specify the custom cluster, uh, you know, the, the cluster specific endpoint and the cluster specific uh, certificate authority. That'll go in there too. But this is on a public network, uh, you know, a public net. So we don't even need to do that. And one of the super cool things here as I mentioned last week, and I do think I got this out, is that EKS Cuddle fully supports the launch template support in managed node groups now, which means that you don't even actually have to put your bootstrap into a launch template or even define a launch template. The way that they've implemented this is they will create a launch template for you if you don't specify one. Now you can have a managed node group, um, there is a configuration element for a, a launch template ID and the version. But this is super slick because if you're already using EKS Cuddle, Heck, this yeah. is already your workflow. This, yeah. You don't do anything different. Under the covers, EKS Cuddle will go create a launch template for you and use it, which is pretty neat. And so you can see there I we just, have the bootstrap script. I, I just want to say EKS Cuddle, I'm always going to just repeat how the person before me says it. Um, EKS Cuddle is Control. the amount of, of oh. heavy heavy lifting that it does on your behalf is really nice. So, you know, this is just one example where it'll create the um, the launch configuration. It does all these things for you. Same with like, if you wanted to set up a service account, it creates the OIDC provider. There's so much more that gets done behind the scenes. And just, I just wanted to point that out. Just one of the really nice, one of the reasons to yeah. use EKS control is to, so you can get rid of all that boilerplate and really just define what you want and let EKS cuddle control do it for you. Yep. So what this is doing right now, if you're not familiar with EKS Cuddle, what uh, Cuddle, 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 Cuddle Control CTL. So if you're not familiar with EKS Cuddle, what it's doing right now is it's creating CloudFormation stacks and kicking that the role and responsibility of making sure that that state is arrived at uh, to CloudFormation, which is awesome because that that means you can effectively kick off a bunch of things out of band and you can just trust them to get done. And when you're right. creating clusters, you're creating managed node groups, you're doing updates, there's a lot of state involved and CloudFormation will manage all of it for you. Yeah. So NetHole has a question. Uh, thoughts on including the files in the image versus retrieving them from S3? Um, he's largely been using standard images instead of custom built to keep from getting harassed by compliance folks about patches. Um, you know, I've been in that uh, regulated environment before Adam, you have to, um, you know, using there, there, there is a certain value in using a provided image that you can sort of say, you know, someone else is taking care of that and I'm just tweaking it on boot. Um, but then that does kind of go against building the artifact and having the artifact and being able to go back and reference old artifacts if you ever need to. So, I think you have to kind of decide for yourself. Uh, I would say the artifact style is probably the thing that I think matches up with the you know managing containers and the way Bottle Rocket works and, and all that stuff. However, if that causes you grief, you know because you're in a regulated environment and you can sort of shed some of that grief uh, by doing it that way, I totally get it, and I did the same thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's a choice that you have to make for yourself. Yeah. And I just, I posted a link to uh, EC2 image yeah. builder. Just if you have to manage an AMI and, and customize it, 
use something that can manage it in a pipeline where it's automated. When there's a new version, it's simply there's a pipeline to build it and deploy it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And Justin says, don't put anything yep. in user data that has an external dependency. At some yes. point, you'll be able to scale yep. up with the external when the external dependency is down. I think one thing that could be cool to do would be back to your image builder idea. Um, trigger that every time an AMI gets updated. So like your starting point could be the the EKS managed AMI, but you okay. could then take that and customize it into your own custom AMI. And you could trigger that every time we update the AMI ID, it could just kick off a build immediately behind the scenes and uh, you know customize your own AMI. And then from there you could have another event that kicks off and goes and updates all of your node groups, your managed node groups for you. Oh, I love that. We should build that in a demo. I, I good. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, write that down. That's your I'll <laughs> do I'll do the VP's custom VPC thing. You do uh, what I just said. Deal. Yeah, Jesse, well, did you hear that? He, yes, what did you said? I just that? wrote it down. I didn't, okay. I didn't, I didn't write it down. I think he was talking um, no, I, I think just one observation there is, you know, we talk so much of, you know, with the advent of microservices and the architecture and how we align our tech stacks to support that, because everything, literally everything comes from the goals of, of DevOps before it was even called DevOps. You want to go fast, you want to be able to pivot, you want to uh, lower your blast radius, you want to separate concerns, right? And that last one, that goes for your infrastructure too. So, you know, to Justin's point, it's like you're, you're you know, if, if if whatever you fail on as a dependency, uh, you know, is, is going to cause you grief, which it always will, you should ensure that that failure is specifically germane to that step. So if you have something that needs to come along for user auth when your app is up and running, do not put it into your build pipeline for your AMI to get your new infrastructure rolled out, right? So you you're basically separating concerns and 99% of the time, if you abstractly think about it that way, it's probably the right thing. This nice. Yeah. Anyway, I meant for that to be like 10 seconds long. I feel like I just talked for five minutes. Um, we have, we, we me, have only about five minutes left. Yeah. Did so you, let me, let me kick a couple more things off here. Bottle yeah. Rocket, yeah. Rocket, bottle yeah. Rocket. And, we, and we have, and we have seven or eight minutes left, depending on which cock you get. So, uh, well, anyways, so this, I do want so to recap the, at the end. You're wasting time. All right. So you're so selfish, Jesse. So this is this AMI I built with the custom AMI builder project, which is really rad. And it's RHEL 7 and it's Stig hardened. I just wanted to show quickly this is how you use a launch template with a custom AMI. You simply show uh, you simp simply specify the AMI ID and image ID. That's it. The rest of it's just the rest of your launch template. And of course, your user data here in this case is uh is your bootstrap. I mean, that's, that's all that's in there. Okay. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and make a mess on the screen. What was that? So we're going to create, like create a launch template. Oh, Bada bing. Code, You've seen that already. Code artifact. Sorry. What are you saying, Adam? Nothing. Sorry. Just thinking out loud. Yeah. Oh, he, cool. has to, he has to verbalize what he's thinking. It, it helps cool. us read his mind though. Yeah. That's, That's fine. <laughs> I'm just trying to kick this. Then we can talk, right? Because I just wanted to kick it. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm just I'm just gonna let that bake. You guys have seen this. You know how it works. It's gonna be in creating for a little while, then it'll show up. So I'm gonna kick off the creme de la creme, as our pastry, our resident pastry chef has has indicated. Um, so Bottle Rocket's a little different. So Bottle Rocket is an open source project from. Uh, from AWS and it is integrated with, though you don't necessarily have to use it with EKS. And it's also integrated in a way that you can just specify the configuration it needs to get started in the launch template. It doesn't, you don't need a shell script or anything. So I'm just gonna show you that briefly. Uh, bottle rocket, oh, BR user data. <laughs> so the BR user data can be as simple as this. Now this is an example of the wall of text isn't, you know, the wall of text is not simple, but you can see here's the API server. That is uh, code for the EKS uh, cluster uh, endpoint. This could also be a, a another Kubernetes cluster endpoint. The cluster certificate is this big wall of text, and then the cluster name. 
that's it. That's all you need to do. And we set it into the settings.kubernetes. And that is, once again, we've we've encoded that base64. It's in here. We've set a security group. So that's the cluster SG for the cluster. So it can join. Um, the instance type we've specified is C3 small. Our image ID. So this is obviously a bottle rocket image. OK, that's it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and I'm just going to cut and paste this because I know I'll screw it up otherwise. <laughs> Create a launch template. And create a node group. And that's going to go off and oh good, Whew. my Ooh. goodness. When Ed, yeah, I know. I was a little scared out? there. I know. I just said I, it's kind of a big deal. Can we just acknowledge that? <laughs> just saying. Okay. What? Ed, you, got, you got something right. Okay, I did it. <laughs> what did you wait? What did I miss? Putting that on my resume. So, by the way, welcome, Edge Geek. Uh, I think you were here last week too. I don't remember, but um, you should plug his show. He it's definitely show. he does. He was just on a couple of hours ago. Sessions from Sam. Uh, he's going to rename it to Sam on the Couch or something like that. So um, that would be pretty awesome. But oh. Jesse, he okay, wants gotcha. to know how to do the cool graphs at the bottom of of his terminal. So first so, of all. Somebody also asked me about my prompt. Uh, Justin teased me about my prompt, but somebody asked me nicely about it. So this is all just uh, Zish, right? So this is oh my Zish, and I've got uh, Cube PS1 here. This is uh, just a little AW. Yeah, exactly. I use oh my Zish, Zish, which Justin himself will say is sluggish and slow and Really, you should just use Ed as your text editor and and configure the shell in memory. But I whatever. Think it's just Justin is super fast. That's yeah. that's really you know he's like two x. So <laughs> use what makes you. Oh, he's so good. Look at him. He's so right. good. We that's know right. that you don't really mean it badly. We're just teasing you back. You're the best, Justin. Um, and you should use what makes you happy. If you like how this looks, it's fairly easy to do with Oh My Zish. Uh, this is a uh, yeah. Just a couple of add-ons. And then the things at the bottom here, this is for my term too. I'm just it's gonna just keep saying that. We should do a show on that. I know I know the time is ticking here. We talked too much. It's still creating. Um hopefully I'm gonna get all of this done. Well, let's bounce over here and just really quickly take a look at our um, nodes again. And this time yeah. we'll look at our OS. Again, these are all managed nodes running in Amazon EKS. You see, we've got a mix up. Oh, I, got, I see a bottle rocket. Right? So these are all ready to serve work. And like I said, this could be like a 1,000 nodes. It could be two, whatever. But you see the mix here. One, one set of these is actually Stig hardened that we saw before, and the other isn't. And we have bottle rocket. I think we did it, folks. We and did hopefully it. Yeah. We didn't, hopefully, we didn't go so fast that it didn't make sense. But I... You know, you can reach us all on Twitter. You can harass these guys anytime. See? Nice. Very Should I do nice. a blog? Maybe I'll do a blog on, on some of these things that's a little more in-depth or something. Yeah, I think that would be cool. So we got to wrap it up pretty quick yeah. uh, because next up is uh, AWS How Do Y'all uh, partners uh, with AM and, and his crew. So uh, community voices, my bad. So definitely... Join us uh, twitch.tv slash AWS. You can also catch us at twitch.tv slash AWS containers. And then de definitely look for our YouTube page. And uh, with, that, with that, see you all next week. Thanks.